Everybody dreams, but very few actually commit. Oh, I know from experience meeting so many people, you know, they talk about making a movie. Ten years later, they still haven't made the movie. Hello and welcome to Abundant Living with Arif Gilani. Today is my honor and pleasure to have on our premiere interview a great guest and a friend, uh, Mr. Uh, Frank Crusoe, who is an Italian Canadian filmmaker. Welcome, Frank. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Uh, Frank's story and all of the stories that we showcase in this show is to help you, inspire you, to bring out the best in you. Today, we're going to talk about chasing money versus chasing your passions because Frank's story is amazing. He came here as a six-year-old immigrant from Italy, Italy. Southern Italy. Which part of Italy are you from? Calabria. He actually arrived in North Bay, Ontario, because my father had a job waiting for him uh, uh, on the railroad. Oh. A lot of, uh, North Bay was a railroad town. We had a CNR, CPR in the Ontario Northland. Lots of jobs there and uh, my uncle by marriage uh, was a foreman on the CPR so he said to my dad, if you come here you got a job. My dad was actually on his way to bring our family to uh, uh, Connecticut because oh. he had, we have a, a Car tons of Carusos there because my dad came from a very large family. Most of the relatives on his side were all in the States. So I almost became American. And at the last minute, he decided to come to Canada and uh, because there was a job waiting for him. So Beautiful. There you go. What a story of uh, immigrant stories. Again, yeah. we're going to dig in. The city of Toronto is full of great talent, like Frank said. So how did you start out your career? Well, when I was a kid, I always dreamed, you know, watching TV, the uh, I Love Lucy show. I fell in love with the entertainment. Where'd you learn to do all this? Go on. Just a natural born cook, I guess. <laughs> I never imagined myself becoming a filmmaker or uh, an actor. It wasn't like that at all. It, it was just like a very general umbrella sort of thing where I said, I want to be in the entertainment business. That's what my goal was. Right from the time I was a kid, I thought, I'm so attracted to the entertainment business. So uh, during school, during high school, I got involved in school plays, mm -hmm. uh, folk club. Uh, I started a, a folk trio. That's when folk music was really in. Then I started. This is back in, let's say, 60s, 1960s, 60s and 1960s, yeah. Wow. And, wow. Then I, and then I started my own band. Uh, uh, I played uh, a bit of keyboards because I used to play the accordion, so the keyboards were, you know, made sense. And I, then I picked up a guitar and I started playing guitar. But it, for me, that was all fun. The, my real passion was not being on stage, it was behind the scenes. My real passion was organizing. I loved mm -hmm. to organize. So uh, in high school, I was elected uh, president of the Students' Council and I, I did concerts, you know, organized concerts. Besides the usual dances, uh, I brought some prominent people up and uh, we, r we used to raise money for the school. I brought, uh, there's some poster there of me and Gordon Lightfoot. Mm -hmm. That's when uh, 1968. Wow. Yeah. So Frank, uh, you had uh, your restaurant business in some, but, at some point in your but life. Let me explain how that happened. Uh -huh. okay? so, so what happened was that because I enjoyed organizing and I enjoyed music, but more behind the scenes. And um, so I st started up a little club. It was very successful, but once it got successful, I did all the renovations. The landlord kicked us out because he had another tenant mm. who was willing to pay three times more than we were paying, but <laughs> we were the ones who fixed it all up. You know, this is in, in Toronto? No, in North Bay. North I, did, Bay. I, I didn't come to uh, Toronto until 92. Similar, we, I came to Toronto in 93, so we have we're a history close. of 30 years together. So what happened was, uh, you know, he kicked me out and we were doing really well, but you know, he said, can you Money pay me this much? Part. I said, I can't pay that much as well. We got somebody else. So then I went and I purchased an old building in North Bay, mm -hmm. and I called it the Carlo Club. There, we, we had bands. We had uh, uh, mini concerts. Yeah, it, was fun. it was fun. It was not a very big place, but it was, again, very successful. But then people came in asking for food. Ah. It's what we do is we just charge the door, you know, like 25 cents and then 10 cents for a coffee. We're talking like 1969 now, you know, <laughs> imagine 10 cents for a coffee. <laughs> but people wanted food. So I, I said, OK, well, I, we, there was a little kitchenette, very tiny, and we started making sandwiches. OK, so that's how it all started. Like I never intended to open up a restaurant. Then what happened was the drinking age in Ontario dropped from 21 down to 18. 
that was disastrous because we weren't licensed. So all the all the kids who used to come to my place, all went, to... they all went to the bars. So now I'm sitting there with an empty space, and I'm going, what am I going to do with it? So I opened up a restaurant. That's how it happened. I didn't intend to. I'd never run a restaurant in my life. And then so, from there, I just kept expanding, and I wound up with eight of them. But that was just kind of like by fluke. You know? So am I uh, right in assuming that you were just uh, chasing your passion of really entertainment, and that was just a side project that developed into a big business eventually? Yeah. Correctly? But, but I always wanted to get back. In, it, uh, even when I was running restaurants, I wanted to get back into entertainment. But, you know, by, by then I was married, a family, of three kids, and, uh, you know, lots of responsibilities. So, you know, I kept um, my restaurants open, which is what, you know, kept us live and fed us live. Nice. So at some point you decided to move to Toronto and pursue your lifelong passion. What yeah. happened there? Why well, did you decide to? Prior to moving it? here, I started up in 1980, I opened up a theater in North Bay, a dinner theater concept. Again, it was really great, great experience, great experience. And we got hit with the recession in the early 80s. It was killer. I mean, interest rates hit 21%. Mm. People think 10% or 9% today is awful. Imagine 21% interest wow. rates. Yeah. I shut down my theater, but I, well, I, but I kept my theater company going. So we wound up doing lots of theater. We became a touring company. All this time, I still had my restaurants, but we toured. And uh, so I wound up producing like 45 stage shows, you know, I uh, got into directing, producing. I even did some acting. I did 21 lead roles in theater. And then one morning I woke up just, you know, I just woke up one morning and said, I realized how limiting it was, you know, doing theater because you know, if you if you are in a theater that holds 200 people, 300 people, that's it. But if you're what, doing a movie or a TV show, you've got millions of people. And I thought, why am I wasting my time? And you know what I mean? <laughs> I enjoy. It, don't get me wrong. I love theater. I still to this day wish I was still doing it, but but it's very limiting. Okay. So then I woke up one morning, and I'll tell you what happened, though. I did a show um, up in Timmins, Ontario, because we toured. We, we went everywhere. And uh, after the show, uh, we sat at a table. They invited us to come to a table. One of the patrons, he was a little tipsy. He had a few too many drinks. He goes, Frank, you've been coming up here for five years. I said, yeah. He says, you guys are really good. He says, Frank, you're really good. He says, what the hell are you doing up here? What are you doing up here? Why aren't you in Hollywood? Why aren't you in New York? And I, I, I just laughed it off. But then it hit me, you know. Uh, like what a week later, what I am I up, doing here? Actually? And I thought he's right because you know you, it's just same old, same old. And I, I loved it, but still same old, same old. So, so, so I woke up and I called a friend of mine in Toronto. I was still living in North Bay, and I said, uh, <clears throat> "Didn't you tell me you were going to be involved in the movie?" He says, "Yeah, but they're not ready yet. They're going to be in the fall." I said, "Okay, I want to be part of it." He says, "They don't have any money." I said, "I don't care. I'll come down and volunteer." So that's what I did. So I volunteered and then I, I worked for free for six weeks on this movie. It was really, it was so low, it was so low budget. We brought our own lunches. <laughs> okay. wow, wow. We're talking really low budget. But, you know, I, I just learned so much from it. And, uh, you know, but you know what you really learn in these situations? You learn what not to do. Yes, I still didn't know what to do because I had no formal training as a filmmaker. But I made a list of things you don't do. Let me ask you some specific <coughs> questions here, sure. because you brought us so much knowledge and so much value. I don't mm. want to miss any chances digging out all okay. the nuggets here. One of the things you did, let's say you wanted to be a part of this movie industry, your friends tells you that they don't have money to pay you, you volunteer. Yeah. So one of the things that I talk about in my book is really going the extra mile. You went out of your way, you volunteered to be on a set of a movie just mm. to have a chance to be in front of movie people. Am well, I correct? To learn. To learn, so you can go to uh, you can go to college, or, uh, get a degree or a diploma. One way, most people do. You spend thousands and thousands of dollars, and uh, at the end of it, you still haven't made a movie. I mean, you mm -hmm. you do student films, but with all due respect, they don't count. Nobody mm -hmm. cares about you know. I mean, it's good for the students, but no nobody really cares. You know, when you put it on your resume, they say, "Have you done any movies?" We're talking feature films. So in six weeks, it was the equivalent of a three-year degree because I learned so much. Because I learned I learned fast, not by I read, but mostly I learn by watching. I watch and go, oh yeah, I Visual get it. learner. And don't forget, I came from a business background and also a theater background. So even though I didn't know what I was doing, in, in, you know, technically in the movies, I understood acting, I understood directing, I understood producing. So those parts I had done. But then, you know, um, the all the techniques of directing a movie or be, you know so sound and everything else. That's let's talk about game. the movie industry, Frank. Mm -hmm. This you have produced uh, eight movies, you have directed eight movies. Well, I, a lot of lot of the, themes are in the city. You love the city of Toronto. A lot of mm -hmm. uh, you know other 
uh, Toronto talent, like we have Keanu Reeves to, uh, you know, uh, other talents who move about to America, mm -hmm. like the guy said. But you decided to stay with the grassroots right here in Toronto. Well, sure. I mean, Tor Toronto is the third or fourth largest film center in North America. So I don't understand this whole notion that you have to be um, in, Hollywood. In, in Hollywood. It's like I, I've been there in Hollywood. It's like you go to the studios and it's the same studio, same look. They look the same as Pinewood Studios, which is five minutes away from me. It, a studio is a studio. Uh, cameras are cameras. Cru we have some of the best crews in the world here in Toronto. So why? Why? I, okay, you know, bigger things happen. Uh, I get it, but also there's more competition. So you're put, you're you're throwing yourself into a big, you know, snake pit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought, okay, well, um, I know people here. You know, it, it's you need a power base. Mm -hmm. You need a power base. So um, I know people here. You know, you, people you work with, and so it makes sense. I have no desire to go anywhere. Now, if I have to shoot a movie somewhere else because somebody asked me to, of course I'll go. Of course. But I'm not, I don't gravitate towards Hollywood because, I mean, what's Hollywood? It's, it's bricks and mortars and streets. You know, I came back, <laughs> I came back from L.A. Uh, one time and uh, the, this girl I know called me, she goes, oh, I heard you were down in L.A. I said, yeah. She goes, what's it like? I said, I don't know what you mean. She said, well, what's it like? I said, uh, okay. I don't really understand what, what you're asking me, but I mean, it's like uh, I woke up in the morning, had breakfast, and, just like and then I, w I went for a walk, and you know what I saw? I saw people, and there was buses and taxis, and she goes, oh, come on, you put me on. I said, excuse me, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to go down there, and they're going to roll a red carpet for me? <laughs> Who am I? And a little fairy from Disney is going to come over and sprinkle fairy dust on me? And I, like, I don't understand what you're asking me. It's a city, like any other city. So it, it, you know you got to go. You got to move. If you're going to move there, you got to work hard. You got to start from scratch, and you got to work everybody else. People, even stars, have to audition. You know, absolutely. they don't just wake up in the morning have a. You know, I don't care how famous you are. You still have to audition. So since then, uh, Frank, uh, if I may, you have dedicated your life into the entertainment industry in the mm -hmm. grassroots of community in Toronto. Actually, mm -hmm. some of the projects or judges of some of these festivals you've been. You mentioned mm -hmm. you've been part of the Italian. Uh, we're yeah. Also yeah, well, in Polish. Yeah. And then well, in '99, I was uh, I, I co-founded the uh, Toronto Italian Film Festival. I mm -hmm. did it for six years. It got took up way too much of my time. Um, that particular version of it folded, but a new version came in with some excellent, excellent people, and it's really well done. Now, I mean, I kudos to the people who who kept it going. But after six years, it was really time consuming, and you know, it, mostly it was a volunteer thing, and uh, you can only volunteer so much. But I was. Also um, asked to be a, a part of the jury for the uh, Polish Film Festival. I did that for two years. The Vaughn Film Festival, uh, Macedonian Film Festival for five years. And this will be my fourth year for the uh, uh, Film for Peace Festival. I'm the head judge. So, you know, uh, and, and the Gemini Awards, TV Awards, I was Gemini. a judge on that. So, uh, you know, well, I have a lot of expertise in, in the film industry. and. Uh, I know a lot. I know a lot about a lot of so things. <laughs> so part of what we do, uh, Frank, in uh, Abundant Living, again, one of the examples that I always look up to is uh, Bob Proctor, who passed away actually this year. But he was 82, and he started to build his recording studio in the personal development. Born risk takers. In his home. At 82. Exactly. And wow. he said, people told me, like, what are you doing? Are you crazy at 82? He says, listen, I got 82 years of experience That's that right. I can now use. Yeah. So it's a blessing. Blessing to have you um, both as a mentor, as a friend, Frank, and we have some projects. Let me see some of the movies that you have, and uh, sure. we're going to showcase some well, of these um, projects that Frank I, I produ I've produced 12 films, but um, I was a higher producer. I, I, seven of them are my own under my company, and the others I, I was a higher uh, producer, a higher gun. So uh, these, are, these are a few. Oh, by the way, five of my movies right now are, are airing on uh, Amazon Prime Canada. Mm. Okay, and a couple of them are still in the in the, uh, in the U.S., but five. Uh, anyway, these are a couple of them. This is my comedy called mm -hmm. Club Utopia. It's pretty yeah. zany. <laughs> it's a pretty crazy comedy. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's fun. Um, this one here, Risk Factors Action Adventure, and on Movie Central, um, I got about 1.3 million views on that. Okay, and. Um, uh, Final Dance, which is uh, one of my favorites I've done. It's an art film based on a stage play. It was uh, originally written in Russian language. The writer is actually Ukrainian, but he wrote in the Russian language. And I saw the play, and I thought, this would make a good movie. And it's, it's an art film. Okay, It's not for everybody, but if you love theater, 
If you love theater, watch this movie. <laughs> Frank, I heard another mentor of mine that says that in the, let's say, 90s, uh, 2000s, and earlier part of this last uh, 50 years, mm -hmm. engineering was the key to success. You want to be an engineer, you build a structure, you did mm -hmm. something like this, even an electric or whatever. Mm -hmm. He says now is really soft, it's skills like film, like photography, like mm -hmm. videography, people who aspire to be directors, actors, movie mm -hmm. makers. What mm -hmm. advice do you have for them right now as you said one of them is really take a volunteer job like you said like I'm gonna give the same advice somebody gave me years ago uh, when I was on that first movie set working for free <laughs> I asked one person who was there who was a, a production manager but they didn't have enough money to keep him on every day so he'd pop in and just make sure things were moving very nice guy so I asked him um, what advice can you give me he said uh, Frank is it is that your name I said yeah we didn't know each other. He says, he says uh, show up. I said, what? No. The best advice I can give you is just show up and keep showing up and keep showing up and keep showing up because then everybody's going to notice that you keep showing up. Other people may not show up, and, but you're there. All of a sudden, it's like, whoa, who is this guy? Make yourself visible. And I thought, that's great advice. So that's what I did. I just kept showing up and <laughs> showing up, you know. And, and, and eventually, people, people say, well, he's... I don't know what he's done, but he keeps showing up, and uh, he seems like he's a good worker, which I, I was. I've always been a good worker. I, you know, first on set, last off set, even as a director. I, uh, when I do indie films, and they're all non-union, I actually help load up the trucks after wow. I finish directing. Now, you try to do it on a union film, okay? <laughs> they, this, they throw you out. <laughs> this really goes back to uh, Frank, to doing the extra work that is required to be successful. And it's not easy, is it? No. Like you're setting yourself apart from everybody else. You're putting, uh, let's say right now, gas in your car. You're going somewhere that uh, mm -hmm. uh, before anybody else, you're leaving. You're doing some extra work, uh, but you're opening up doors for yourself. Mm -hmm. Is that what happened to you? Let me use an analogy. I also teach acting, and I tell people, you know, you open a door and you think that's it. No, you open a door, and there's another door, and some people are afraid to open the other door. So open the other door. There's another corridor with 15 other doors. You go, whoa, I didn't know this was here. And then you open one of those doors and it keeps going and going. And you, ha you have to keep opening doors. Some people expect the doors are going to open for them. The doors don't open on their own unless you're at uh, Walmart or something. Where it, it, you know. <laughs> no, you have, to, you have to open the door because you don't know what's going to be on the other side. And uh, so many people are afraid to do that because everybody dreams, but very few actually commit. I, I know I know from experience meeting so many people, you know, they talk about making a movie. Ten years later, they still haven't made the movie. They still they keep talking about it because the reality is it's really, really difficult to make a movie. Very Frank, difficult. Yeah. You said something really deep and insightful, Frank. So you said a lot of people dream, but very few commit. Yes. What can you tell us about commitment? This, this word, commitment, is a big word. And I encourage people to commit to whatever mm -hmm. you have to. Maybe your commitment, like, uh, you know, we know life goes in different directions. I have two kids, and the mother is a really committed mother to being the mother of my children. Isn't that a blessing mm -hmm. to commit to something? Mm -hmm. And you have committed your life well, to... Well, let me give you an example of commitment versus lack of commitment. When I started making my own movies, the first thing I told potential investors that... I said, just so you know, I've already put money into my own film. I put 50,000 bucks, I Mitch. saved up. And then they took me seriously. Now, you have no idea how many people have come to me. They say, I got a great script, and they're driving fancy cars, and they got nice houses. Um, and I say, okay, you want me to make a movie for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how much are you putting up? Well, I'm not putting anything up, that's your job. I go, my job? <laughs> no, no, that's not my job. <laughs> Wait a minute, you're asking me to make a movie, but you're not willing to put any money up yourself that tells me that you don't believe in what you're doing. So why, why, why are you asking me to put money into your movie when I could take that money and put it into my movie and I know I can make a movie and I know that I can get it out there. So I said, S excuse me, you make no sense. T come back when you're serious. If you're willing to put up, now if it's not your money, find somewhere else, but come to me with some money. So because that's what I learned. You can't just show up and say, oh, I got a great script. I have a basement, I'll show you later, full of scripts. And that's after I cleaned out most of the bad scripts. <laughs> you should see how many scripts I have, piles and piles. Every one of those scripts will make a good movie if there was money attached. Mm. If there's no money attached, 
why are you asking me to what? You want me to put a second mortgage on my house so I can make your movie? You're not willing to put up your own. That's what I'm getting. That's where failure comes in. They're not willing to commit. They're not willing to commit their own money. They say only fool. One, one guy came in with his friend. They want me to, to produce their, their movie. They kept telling us it's our movie. Okay, well, I thought, well, what are you talking to me for if it's your movie? So I, after they talked for about an hour, and I thought, it sounds kind of interesting. I said, so who's directing? I am, the guy says. I said, have you ever directed before? He says, no, but uh, you've got to start somewhere. Oh, you want to start somewhere. you never directed before, but you want me to raise the money so you can experiment. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, if the movie doesn't make any money, who's responsible, you or me? Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. How much are you willing to commit? He started to laugh. He says, only fools invest in their own films. I said, okay, I have a front door, a back door, and two windows. How would you like to leave? <laughs> this is really important because we're talking about <laughs> commitment, putting your word. A lot of people dream, like um, Frank said, very few people commit. This is really important. If yeah. you got a dream, if you got something that's up in your mind, if something is keeping you up at night, that's your passion telling you, hey, listen, knock here, open this door. Now, Frank, mm -hmm. you have some new projects at, uh, uh, mm -hmm. at the Bay. You have a movie that's coming in to October. In October, yeah. we also have a global project where we are basically a part of this uh, unique setup that you have set up. Tell us yeah. a little bit about the company, and you have sent me all of the information. Sure. I mean, we're 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 initiating a company. We right now we're calling it American Film Partners. It's uh, we have uh, producers in the U.S. and producers here. I I will be in charge of the Canadian production arm, and um, basically we're we're putting together uh, like an umbrella company. And what we all help each other make films, you know, for example, uh, uh, from our end, you know, we, may, we can raise a certain amount of capital because we want to go public with it. And then um, from the from our producers in, uh, in, in the States, they can they can uh, access uh, talent. We can't necessarily because they're, they're there. So we we all help each other. That's the whole idea. So a part of this is also our collaboration together. Frank, I've been blessed to have come in contact with Frank. This is one of the again philosophies that I talk about networking. You know how I found Frank? I had a friend who was a musician. I go to a bar one day and I see this cowboy guy is singing, black guy singing his tunes from the West or whatever, <laughs> Texas, Dallas. Yeah, yeah. And then... Uh, Trevor. Uh, yeah, Trevor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, uh, I meet with him after his music was done. I buy him a drink and I said, I'm in Toronto, I'm new. And he said, oh man, this guy would love, uh, you would love to meet Frank. And that's how we started this connection. And it's been years now. Frank's been my mentor, my coach. Uh, Frank, uh, recently was your birthday. So I wanted to present to the special gift that uh, everywhere that I go is part of what I really present as part of me, which uh, Frank has read our first book, The Mountains Are Calling, fell yeah, in love with the book. story. Yeah. We have a great project also to make an international film with Frank, but this book just came out. Ministry of Miracles, Frank. This is your copy, so well, we can go you. and get uh, some miracles done. I know that you have a movie set that you're um, shooting in October. Cold weather in Canada is going to be brutal this year. So not not in October. Special pair ah. of gloves. You're going to sign this for me, right? Absolutely. Camel okay. wool inside and leather. My pair I have for um, four years now. I've taken them through Iran, Iraq, Turkey, all of the Middle East and Mongolia, and they're still intact. So. Thank you. With uh, respect, this is for you and uh, from the Camel Company of Canada. And uh, we appreciate your time, Frank. I wanted to um, ask you one more time, people who are interested in getting involved in your projects, in our projects. We are looking for investors. We are looking for collaborators. We're looking for business people to join our community again. Um, some of the um, people that will see this video might be potential investors into even immigrating to Canada through these projects that we're talking about. Uh, what would you say to some people who want and like this video, want to collaborate with you? Where do they find well, I'm, you? I'm total, uh, well, we'll, we'll, put, we'll put it on the screen. All of the information? Uh, all the information, how to reach me, my, uh, my phone number, email address. And uh, I'm always open to collaborations and, uh, and also... The other things too uh, is that you work with me, you're going to learn a lot because I, I'm, I'm a good teacher. I'm not afraid to share my knowledge. Some people don't, but I, I share my knowledge. I'm not afraid of that. 
Well, uh, as a result of that, I'm going to inject in there, as a result of coming in contact with you, my interview skills have increased uh, tremendously, just doing some little work here and there with you. But I'm looking forward for the next uh, 5, 10, 20, 30 years, Frank. At we least, have a lot of work. <laughs> we have a lot of work ahead of us. Again, thank, uh, thank God we live in a country that allows us to say this because of the great health care that I'm actually a byproduct of rebuilding my body, you know, my story, but uh, your story as well. You had a couple of surgeries but you've come out stronger now we're looking forward to the next I'm a tough guy <laughs> <laughs> I love the spirit again uh, thank you for watching we look forward to getting your feedbacks if you have any questions for uh, Frank you can reach out either to me or to Frank directly but uh, all of you who are looking forward to building a better life for you and uh, focusing on your career, make your passion the main focus of your effort. What do you think, uh, passion versus money? Last words. Uh, uh, well, you, you make money doing things you're passionate about because otherwise you'll be miserable. You might be rich. I know I've met a lot of very, very wealthy, miserable people, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, because they're not passionate about what they do. So uh, find your passion and get really good at it and you'll make money. That's that's my thing. It will happen, but you got to be pa and <laughs> you have to be good at it too. You know, you can't just be. Pa a lot of people are passionate about things, but they they don't read. Really, they're not necessarily good at it. But you can be as passionate as you want. You have to do the work that goes with it. Absolutely. Going the extra mile again. Oh, absolutely. So looking forward to seeing you on the next interview. Thank you, Frank, for my for pleasure. your great for your time. Thank you for hosting us and happy birthday again. Look forward well, to you. the you. future. Thank you. Yes. Thanks.